On August 27th this year, I suffered a main lift cable failure on my US tower crank up. And since that tower was the driven element for my four element, triangular, parasitic array, I needed to go to plan B. I mean, after all, no real 160 meter DXer is going to be off the air for a full winter season, right? So let me show you what I've done to use these three existing elements to achieve over 4 dB of gain over a single vertical to cover 12 directions. Yeah, that's what I said. Using a simple combination of these three elements, 12 directions can be selected to provide forward gain. It's really quite simple. Let me show you how this works, how the array models, and how it compares to field testing that I did using my drone, testing it in the truck with my SDR radio, and also doing some on-air Kiwi uh, testing. Let's get started. The three elements that surrounded the central tower were originally tuned as either a reflector or a director to provide three element gain uh, in six directions, played against the central tower, which was the driver. Well now, since the central tower is gone, I've installed three equal length RG8 coax feed lines to each of these elements that meet together in the middle uh, at a switch box. This way, any one of these three elements can be fed as a driver. Uh, the elements are set up in a triangle with 120 uh, degree angular displacement. The north element at 0 degrees, the southeast element at 120, and the southwest element at 240 degrees. They're spaced about 100 feet apart. Uh, the elements are all insulated from the ground and are series fed, and this makes it easy to tune them as a reflector by just adding a series inductor at the base. Uh, the first six directions are pretty obvious, I think, using a two element driven reflector model. For the northeast direction, Europe, for example, uh, the north element is driven, while the southwest is tuned as a reflector. Obviously, the southeast uh, element remains ungrounded and is therefore invisible. So here's the Fornec 2 output for that two element design, uh, showing the azimuth plot. It yields a gain of about 5.5 dBi and a modest 11 dB front to back. So here's that same azimuth plot with a single vertical overlaid. So now we can see we should expect about a 4.3 dB improvement over a single radiator. Well, how does it test in the field? Here's my field test setup. I use an SDR IQ radio, which is connected to a short vertical using a trans impedance amplifier. So I drive out with the truck uh, about two kilometers or so from the station and using my laptop, which I tethered to my iPhone data plan, I log into the remote station and control the radio to transmit about 10 watts. From each of the surrounding 12 stops, I switch through all of the directions as well as use Omni with all of the elements, uh, that is to say all of the unfed elements floating. In order to expedite the uh, test process in the field, rather than record each measurement as I do it in real time, I just do a PC screen recording video using the free Windows snipping program. This way, I can carefully review and uh, record the values later on at home. So in the field, I measure almost exactly 4 dB of gain over a single vertical. Now listen, as far as I'm concerned, this is the most meaningful performance test we can do uh, for a directive array. I mean, we can't ever really measure absolute gain, but compared, uh, comparing the forward gain of the array compared to just a single element from the same array is reality. I mean, that's the actual measured gain you have achieved compared to not having an array. So for the east direction, we feed the southeast element and tune the southwest as a reflector while the north floats, giving this pattern. Feed the southeast, but tune the north element as a reflector, we get the southeast pattern. Southeast fed, north as a reflector, gives us southwest. Southwest fed, southeast reflector, we get west gain. And then north fed and southeast reflector, we get gain to Japan. Okay, look, this may sound like a complicated thing to implement and switch, but really stay with me here. I'm gonna show you how it's really easy to do using a few tricks. Here's how the field measured uh, azimuth patterns compare to the model. The fat, hand-drawn lines are from the measured field data. Uh, this plot's an average from all six of the measurements I made from the truck. It sure looks like a close match to me. Uh, these values are plotted up by normalizing each station stop uh, to the omni direction for that same station stop. This way, the values are corrected for distance amplitude variations. 
I also flew the drone that carries my 1.834 megahertz uh, signal source. Check out the video link in the uh, description below to learn how to build one of these if you want. I drove out to a location about one and a half kilometers from the radio and flew the drone at an elevation that computes to about a 10 degree wave angle. Here's the drone data for the array averaged over three stops. Okay, cool, but that's just six directions. What about the other six? Well, let's activate all three elements, feed one element as the driver, while the other two are both reflectors, like this. This gives us 5.9 dBi or 4.7 dB over a single vertical. Same thing here, if we feed the southeast, north and southwest are reflectors, we get gain to the southeast. For southwest gain, we set the north and southeast as reflectors. The surprise to me was that the feed point match, the ad is to say the SWR, changed only slightly and remained usable without any change to the matching network. Okay, the last three directions, perhaps you've already guessed, let's feed both the north and the southeast while we tune the southwest as a reflector. Voila, we get 5.8 dBi uh, gain uh, at 60 degrees. That's 4.6 dB over a single element. Repeat for north and southwest fed and southeast reflector for Japan, southeast and southwest fed with north reflector for direct south. All right, this sounds really complicated, right? Well, hey, let me show you how it works in the field and in the shack. Each element has the RG8 coax from the central switch box connected to the vertical through a relay. When an element is fed, this relay is activated, as well as the relay at the central switch box to select that feed line. Each element also has a normally open relay that when activated will ground the vertical and make it active. So each element is either floating, fed, or tuned as a reflector. By the way, these switching relays don't need to be expensive hard to get and RF rated vacuum units. For years, I've been using these simple 16 amp non RF rated uh, Omron units and they've performed really well without issue at kilowatt levels. Now, I can bet you're thinking, sure, but how on earth do you switch this thing? Okay, well, each of the coax feed relays at each element is assigned to a relay on this KMtronic 8 relay ethernet board and the tune, detune relay at each element is controlled by three other relays on the board. This is how I've labeled the KMtronic relays, southwest active, north active, southeast active. These will close the float or grounding relay at the element and make it active. The feed relays select the correct feed line and close the feed relay at the selected vertical. Now, the switching is easy because of this great program by YO3 DMU called PST Rotator that can control these KMtronic boards using something called the command function. There's 10 commands that can select any combination of the relays. So, for example, I've labeled command 2 as EU for Europe. It makes southwest and north active and feeds the north. East direction selects southwest and southeast active and feeds the southeast element. Uh, for the South America 2, this is the 2 reflector setup, we'll have all three active and feed the Southeast. There's a real simple command table you can use to fill out the appropriate logic as desired. You can also uh, manually select whatever, whatever element feed combination you want by just toggling the required relays. Of course, the PST Rotator uh, program also allows you to assign uh, any one of these commands to an azimuth direction. So the array can be toggled with the rotor compass GUI like this. Point and shoot for the direction you want. I have made a detailed video about how to use and set up the PST Rotator program and how I use it to control my receive system. Check out the uh, video in the description below if you're interested. Alright, now let's talk about performance bandwidth. The gain and front to back performance bandwidth is what matters, not SWR bandwidth. I fear this is something greatly misunderstood by some about directive arrays. Here is a frequency plot from Fornac 2 for the two element reflector design. Now first notice that the gain peaks around 1830 kHz and the gain is about 5 dBi uh, between 1820 and 1846. Above and below that the gain really drops off. 
So that's about 26 kilohertz of preferred gain bandwidth. Now second, notice that the peak gain, the blue line, and the peak front to back, the red line, don't line up. The peak gain is down around 1830, while the max front to back is around 1840 kilohertz. Sorry, 1846 kilohertz. This offset is always the case with the two element parasitic array. The front to back and gain peaks just don't line up. Let's see if this holds up in the field. What I did at the West Station is I tested the gain in front to back as I moved up and down the band by 2 kHz increments. It agrees pretty closely to the model. The gain peaks down around 1814 kHz where I had this element tuned, while the front to back maxed out up around 1834, about 20 kHz higher, and it's probably even greater high, uh, higher in frequency. This somewhat narrow uh, performance bandwidth is made worse when using shortened, top-loaded elements like I'd use uh, here on 160 meters. So look, if you think you can build a two-element array like this and get it to perform well across the 160 meter band, you're wrong. It will not see the gain in front to back you expect outside about a 20 to 30 kilohertz window. Don't forget, this has nothing to do with SWR bandwidth. Zero. Nada. Less than nothing. You can match an array like this wherever you want and have a nice looking SWR plot, but the gain and front to back are entirely 100% determined by the parasitic tuning and will only peak over a narrow bandwidth that is defined only by the parasitic tuning and the parasitic element bandwidth. So what do we do? Well, it's easy. We implement in-band tuning by relay switching in small 0.5 microhenry inductors to move the operating window across the band. These are the tuning modules I have at the base of each element. They're really quite simple. The element is tuned at the top of the band, then each inductor is switched in to increment the tuning down to the CW end of the band. These modules were quite affordable to build using those 16 amp Omron relays and a PCB that I designed in KiCad and had made in China. Now don't think we're manually switching this thing. I mean, we live in the modern world. Cat data from the radio using something like Station Master like I do or even the PST Rotator program can use cat data from the radio to drive the relays. So the relays increment to follow the radio automatically based on band segments. This is how the SWR sweeps look as they move across the band. But what really matters is that the parasitic reflector tuning is also moving to maintain the max gain and front to back. By the way, the front to back ratio of my two element parasitic will never be spectacular. But because I have highly directive uh, beverage receiving arrays, I don't really care about front to back. I want transmit gain. That is the focus for me. I mean, I don't listen on my transmit antenna. Front to back is greatly improved with a three element parasitic design. Here's a three element parasitic reflector driven director element. And here overlaid with the two is the uh, two element design. Clearly the front to back is much better and the gain is about one dB higher. Also the three element design tends to expand the gain and front to back performance bandwidth as shown here. This is why next year I'm going to be replacing my collapsed central tower with another irrigation tubing element to become the central driver uh, for the four element six direction triangular array. Stay tuned for a video about that later next year. If you ever plan to build a parasitic vertical array of any kind, don't ignore your ground radial system. Just adding a random wire as a parasitic to your tower with a few radials thrown on the ground won't work. You need a low loss ground in order to achieve maximum mutual coupling and build the current in the parasitic. Each of my verticals have 100 radials each. You know, I didn't talk about tuning the parasitics or how I match the feed points, but perhaps that'll be a video for another day. Hey 73, this is Steve, V6WZ.